living in the new world. Now we're going to move on to the town hall piece. What we're going to do is ask anyone who has a question to start lining up down this middle row here. And then we will also ask all candidates to return back to the stage. When you come up to the microphone, just let the candidate know um, that you have a question for them and who you want to direct the question to. Good evening, fellow citizens, council, and candidates. My name is Karen Geach, and I have been a member, resident of the City of Guyton since 1983. I've had the pleasure of living downtown in one of the historic homes. I've had the privilege of serving on the historic committee, and I've also had the privilege of being a council person for four years. My question to Mr. Harville, Ted, and Jeremiah, all three of you, I have the same question for. Will you promise to serve our city and her citizens with transparency, integrity, ethics, morals, and convictions? 100%, absolutely. I'll raise my right hand up and say, I do. <laughs> Those are the fundamental principles which make government work. Government only works if the people can see what's going on if they're involved in it. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, Ms. Pillow, Mr. Reeser, Mr. Garvin, I didn't, I'm sorry, I meant you'd come up there too. <laughs> Mr. Garvin, do you agree to serve under those conditions should you be elected? I do. Hey. Um, Mr. Mayor, Ms. Blood, Mr. Reason, do you believe that you have served our city and her citizens with transparency, integrity, ethics, morals, and convictions during your tenure? 100% without a doubt. Most definitely. Absolutely, and I look forward to doing it again. <laughs> Thank you for your answers, Mr. Mayor. You have just said that you believe that you have served our city and its citizens with transparency, integrity, ethics, morals, and conviction. Yet I challenge you on your response. You have made, you have censored the citizens of this community. We are not allowed to interact with fellow council members without going through you first. You have also made the statement that our opinions don't matter except at the vote. You also agreed that you, you feel you have served our city ethically and with integrity. Yet when you were challenged on a situation that took place within our city during the paving of streets, a simple question was asked of you. You replied with an answer that was condescending and wrong. So I took it upon myself to ask the contractor the answer to the question. When I confronted you at City Hall about said conversation, you told me to get the hell out of City Hall. I feel like that is not showing integrity or ethics because you were challenged about a statement you made 
and you were wrong. You got, we both were angry, but you told me to get out of city, to get the hell out of City Hall. That's my building. That's my City Hall. You just worked for me. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to address that. And I'll start with the first question you asked about rules of decorum. Rules of decorum were voted upon by all five members of council and approved unanimously. It is important for city meetings to be able to function in a timely manner. Some folks can stand up and speak forever, repeating themselves over and over again. While yes, it is important to hear these people, there comes a point where we can't talk about just anything in the city. It needs to be on the agenda. You have means of being put on the agenda. You have means of coming before the city council members outside of meetings. But when we're all arranged together, we also have families and lives outside of here and businesses that we sacrifice so that we can serve. As to telling you to get the hell out of City Hall, yes ma'am, that did happen. Your behavior in City Hall was inappropriate and the police department was considered to be called by our city manager. Instead, I lost my temper with you and asked you to leave in a means that was inappropriate. But you were out of order, ma'am, and that will not be allowed around my employees or in my City Hall. Mr. Mayor, I accept, the, I accept the responsibility that I did get, raised my voice and I was angry. You called me a liar. And I didn't appreciate that. And as far as asking questions of the council before a vote is taken, you do not give us any opportunity. And you stated in several meetings that our opinion did not matter. Whose does, if not mine? And all of these people here. If we'd like to address that as well, anything that's on a public agenda, on the agenda for the meeting, can be discussed in that meeting. There's a public comment section at the beginning and at the end of every meeting. So if there's a vote to be taken, you are allowed to speak on it at council meetings. As far as the statement that was said to Mr. Scott Thompson, during a time of COVID, during a time where we were having meetings over Zoom and phone calls, when it was incredibly difficult, to even understand how to work the dadgum thing, I lost my temper. I'm not a man who's not known to have a temper. I apologize for it. And at the same time, when someone will not stop talking in an online public meeting and continue to yell at council members and behave out of order, I lost my temper and said, I believe the following phrase, what was it? Your input is not necessary. Hold on a second. No, your right input is business. not necessary is exactly what you have said to us on I, numerous occasions, Mr. No, ma'am. I did not say it on numerous yes, occasions. Yes, you did. No, ma'am. Please let me finish my statement. Please give me the opportunity as I've given you. You have the floor. Hence the rules of decorum. We, in that heated meeting, I stated to Mr. Scott Thompson that we do not live in a democracy. We live in a representative republic, which means that we are elected and that outside of that vote, that's your opportunity to speak. That's not fair. That's inappropriate and it was short-sighted to me in terms of the reality of it. We all have a voice. We all have the ability to speak to our elected officials and that's how we get stuff done. If we had to poll 2,400 people every time that we wanted to do something in the city of Guyton, the system would not work. So we elect representatives. And that's why we're here tonight, to pick from this group of people who we want to represent us. And it's a great form of government. It's also an incredibly flawed form of government because we're people. We make mistakes. We make errors. And for those, I apologize. I have not been imperfect. I have not been a saint. But I've come to this every time with my best intentions and my best foot forward, trying to do the best job for the people of the city of Guyton. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lulu Seabricks, and I have a question for all three councilmen. If you will come forward, please. No, council, the ones that's running for council, not the mayor. I have your question also. All three candidates. Four, okay. My question is, what initiative what initiative will you undertake to make our city more attractive to tourists and visitors? One of the things that I, uh, this is a good question. Um, one of the things that we want to do is protect what we have. 
we have a historic district that's the envy of a lot of towns, uh, and it's a wonderful opportunity for us to protect that and make sure that uh, it, it's part of who we are, fabric, part of the fabric of who we are. Earlier, there was a big discussion about mobile homes, and that has really gone off the rails. This council never voted to say no to mobile homes. We took a pause, and now we allow folks who want to put a mobile home in to do the same thing if you want to put a business, or if you want to put a duplex, if you want to do anything that's outside of R1. Um, so what we're doing as a council is we're provide, protecting property rights of all of our citizens. And that's important because if you don't, you can have a mobile home right downtown, you can have uh, business anywhere in the city. Um, so we have good zoning uh, and planning ordinances and we need more people to get involved with that. So I would encourage more people to volunteer and to help us create the vision for our city. Okay, let me repeat the question. What initiatives will you undertake to make our city more attractive to tourists and visitors? Um, I think we're in the process of doing that with the DDA. With, um, we want the DDA to do a beautification of the downtown area. That's one thing. The second thing is, is that within our plan, our master plan, we um, want to bring, we first need to bring in businesses. And then from there, we can decide what type of initiatives we can put forward. But the DDA is the first initiative and that can grow from there. Okay, kind of a long answer, but it's a, it's a complex question. I think the first thing is codifying and mapping out the historic district get, and adopting a local preservation ordinance and then working through the state to get state certification for that historic district because that will open us up to grants to restore historic homes. It will open us up to grants to restore the water tower, which the water tower is the best welcome sign that we could have for the city of Guyton. And on top of that, we have the DDA. I think the DDA is a great resource for the city because it opens us up to other avenues of state funding through grants and other things like a facade grant that can help the downtown businesses update their facade. And one thing that I would like to see do, like to see the city do, is to purchase the, the parking lot right there next to the Southern Cafe, turn that into a true parking lot, take the parking along, along Highway 17 out, extend the curb there for like the Mexican restaurant, the ice cream shop, and the pizza shop so that they can have outdoor dining so that you have a, lo a larger area for them to have outdoor dining. And then on top of that, I would like to apply for CDBG grants. Ms. Pelo mentioned that earlier, but in three and a half years, they've never once applied for those. Those are a great resource to help the low income individuals in this community, whether they be elderly or just be certain circumstances that are outside of their control that they can't fix their homes. Through CBD, we can restore the homes in this community through, with, a, a, with the help of the Historic Preservation Ordinances. So it's, it's a combination of working through the DDA, working through the Historic Preservation Committee, and working through the city, and work, everybody working together. So there's a lot of complex things that we can do to make that, that dream come true. Yeah, I, I agree with Mr. Chancy on that. But, you know, I think that, you know, first you have to ratify the, uh, the historical landmarks because right now there is no historical landmarks. You know, it tried to pass in 1982, but it failed because they wanted to tell you what colors you could and cannot paint your house. Uh, so that failed. So, you know, the, the, land, the, the signs you see in Guyton, they're pretty much false advertisements. So one of the things I wanted to do once elected is uh, pass the bill saying that, you know, Guyton is historic, send it to the state for the state to pass. So once we set that boundary for the Guyton Historical Commission, the landmarks, then you can start working on that. Then you can start saying, hey, look, Guyton is an actual, you know, national registered uh, historical landmark. That'll start bringing in tours and moments on. And then working with the DDA, the DDA is doing a fantastic job with what they're doing and getting things off, getting things off the ground. So partnering up uh, with the DDA, uh, ratifying the historical landmark, uh, those two things by themselves will bring in tourism and uh, and the walking trail. You send the walking trail. I mean, those those are things alone. I mean, we'll bring in tourism by itself. So uh, just. 
you know, then those two things will ensure that God's greatest days are still ahead. Thank you. Guyton is on the National Historic Places Registry. If you look it up, we're there. Dr. Willie Gray, uh, Greer Todd put us there. We've been there for a long time, and I, I have um, confirmation that some people have done that. They've they've gone through and they've rehabbed some of these old homes, and they've received tax credits. So that's in place. If you just Google it, it's, it's out there, National Historic Places. But it was never passed by council, so since it was never passed by council, it was never sent by the state to get ratified. So even though it's on the federal you know, registry, since it was never passed by council and sent to the state, you know, it essentially means nothing. So. Thank you. Not really. <laughs> okay. Um, the mayor. All candidates, priorities are key issues you aim to address as mayor. Priority one is infrastructure. It's getting solutions, working with either neighboring communities to increase our sewer capacity to allow for growth and smart growth. Um, that's number one. Uh, number two is the preservation of our city uh, as it is, the downtown area, and improving and beautifying what we've got through using historic preservation in the Downtown Development Authority. Uh, number three is recreation. The beauty part of that purchase of the YMCA property is it's not the YMCA property. That's a misnomer. We bought 14 acres for $750,000, of which the YMCA is now leasing 3.5 acres. Guyton now has 22.5 acres left in that area with the existing park and the new area to be added to it for the recreation master plan. This will incorporate the old ball field, the old tennis courts, and allow us to build back better and take advantage of funds like build back better, as well as state grants, DNR grants, and not just have to use our own money paying for it. We've got SPLOS funds reserved but we will be able to leverage those funds once we have plans, like the Recreation Master Plan, to build something truly impressive for our children. I think if I had to prioritize, it would be wastewater and drainage would be number one. Public safety uh, would be number two, and we need to get down to community policing. Um, historic preservation, Yes, back in the 80s, there was something that was put out for the um, historic district. Um, everybody could not um, come to an agreement on that, so that was never really ratified. Um, we need to do something to protect the downtown and the historic homes that we have in the city of Guyton. Um, the next one will be the environmental protection. Um, as we grow, we really need to look at what runoff is going to do um, and different things like that. And then last but not least would be the improvement of our recreation uh, facilities, um, improving them, enhancing them, and perhaps building some more. We need soccer fields. And uh, I just, don't get me wrong, I'm for the YMCA, but I think that other $250,000 could have went to rebuilding uh, tennis courts, basketball courts, and softball fields. So I agree with the infrastructures first and foremost. Um, obviously that has to be done. It is in the works, so hopefully they get that finished shortly or soon. Uh, the PD, everybody that knows me knows that I'm on the PD. Um, the way they treat people and the way they are over-policing, essentially, um, with the training that they are not getting, the uh, quality of candidates that they have it needs to change. They are way out of line. And a lot of things that y'all don't see, but when you do the open record request and you do the um, uh, records from Central and all that, there's a lot of things that y'all do not see. And some people will say that this lies, but if, if I'm lying, they're lying to me, so they owe me some money because I pay for these things. Um, the recreation aspect of it, we got a bunch of kids out here. Uh, it'd be a great opportunity for kids to, to play. And we talked about earlier about the uh, baseball teams coming in. You can make a little bit of money on these travel ball teams instead of them going out of state, out of, out of the city. 
Um, a lot of these guys go to Atlanta to play, and we're just missing an opportunity here with that. The recreation is going to be very important, and the bottom line is we've spent the three-quarter million dollars for the property. If the Y wants to come in and pay us a little bit of money back, we might as well take it. And that's going to allow a lot of opportunities for the recreation, uh, even child care. So that's going to, that will help us out. The money's gone. We're stuck with that property for 20 years, no matter how you look at it. So might as well make the best of it. Thank you. My name is Stephen Steiner. My question is going to be directed toward uh, Mr. Reiser. Um, obviously, wastewater and treatment is a topic of contention within the city. Um, so you had mentioned earlier the uh, property off Grayson uh, that was recently sold and is currently in the process of being annexed into the city, that they are not requesting to be uh, attached to the city sewer and water. Um, that is because they are looking to have septic tanks installed in that property. They have not done, to my understanding, an environmental impact on that, and so you said that they have not requested, but my concern is they haven't requested yet. If that property becomes annexed to the city and they cannot have septics installed on those properties, will the city of Guyton be obligated to hook them up to city uh, water or, and sewer? response to that is laissez-faire. So the process is they want to move into the city. They want to be annexed by the city. And that is with the understanding. This administration is forthright with the developers. We don't have the capacity currently for a significant development like that. So we said we can't do that. But if you're interested in half acre lots, septic may be an opportunity that you could pursue. But first of all, we've got to annex them. So that's the first step. Then once they're annexed, we'll take them through the process, we'll do the soil test, we'll have the engineers get involved, we'll do the things that are necessary to make sure that it's appropriate and nothing is going to harm the environment. Um, we, if you look at the map, it's, it, it's actually a nice transgression. You go from a denser neighborhood like Summer Place, that's three, I think a third of an acre type lots, this would be half an acre, um, and then beyond that are more estate size lots. So, it's, it's a nice transition from center city to out, uh, outside of the city limits. So I think to answer your question is, um, the city would not be responsible for something like that. That is the developer's um, responsibility. They, will, they would buy the property and they would be responsible for whatever development they put on. If they cannot put in septic systems, there is no development going in there then because they would not be, but what I'm hearing you say is that they would not be able to be attached to city sewer. Yeah, we don't have the capacity right now, and it's the developer. I mean, they could say, we're going to do exactly, and this would be a great, honestly, this would be a great thing. And not, I'm one who says that the wastewater limitations is not a bad thing. That means we slow the roll. We don't just say yes to everybody like other municipalities have. So we said you cannot tap into our sewer line and, and put smaller lots there. So if, if they couldn't do half acre lots and the septic was not available, they could do a state size lot. You know, they could do what's just down the street in another neighborhood within walking distance, really, from that. So it could be a, a, an even better, in my viewpoint, it could be an even better solution if the lots were bigger. But right now, they're, 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 there's no commitment from the city to this developer for sewer. Thank you. Joe Stegan, 210 M. Miles Avenue. My question is uh, to the current administration, the uh, sidewalks, the uh, curbs, the contractors, when they do come to clean it out, clean it up, they don't pick it up, they blow it back on the property owner's property. And the curb, the water flows from down towards the old city hall, just two, two drains on each side of the road there. They're filled up with leaves, so much the water backs up. On the right side, there's a, over the piers of time, the pavement is built up so high. You have a hole that's about a foot deep, and all the leaves congregate into that one cliff, and it backs up the water where it can't go down to the sea. 
Uh, I don't know if y'all know what the contracts do. I address that when I address them, and they said, they say, we're just doing what we told them to do. This is a great opportunity for everyone in the room to hear this. If there's an issue in the city, we're not everywhere at one time. Our city manager, while she travels the streets and council, I know Councilman Lee and I see each other out and about riding around on a regular basis. But when you see stuff, please tell us. Please get in touch with a council member. Uh, before you leave tonight, if you would catch up with me, I'd like to get the address and all written down and so we can have uh, either EOM or Parker Engineering check that out. Would that work? There again, y'all hire them. Y'all should be the ones that, that police. You should make sure they're doing their job, not blowing the leads back on the uh, citizens of the yard. But they only clean up there. The leads should be picked up, not blown around in the areas that uh, are on the property. You're sparking speaking about the EOM contractors. Whoever cleans up the uh, curbs and sidewalks in, in the city. Okay, good. I step over here for just a second, get your address, and we'll check it out. Okay, when I get through, okay. we have a uh, couple, couple of three uh, sinkholes. I go to Pine Street Baptist Church. <clears throat> we have numerous sinkholes in front of the uh, educational building. It needs to be addressed. The uh, see the problem. A water leak or telephone not uh, backfilling their lines when they uh, put in the new cables. This needs to be addressed in two here. Also, on the police department, uh, I would be in favor of turning it back to the county and getting rid of the police, a guy in the police department. To answer your question about the sinkhole, I did talk to our EOM guy, and I'm not sure if, it, if it's a backfill issue or if that's where that old magnolia was at when the DeWitt's on that property. So I know it's Mark, I know they're working on it, and that was just last week when he was there working. So um, that should, you know, it's all the utilities required, so there should be some progress made there. To address the question about turning over the police department to the sheriff's office, I have spoken with Sheriff McDuffie on a few occasions, especially when I first came into office, as well as Chief, Detect Chief Deputy Richard Bush. The reality is, is they are just now getting to a point where they have, are almost at full manpower. Sheriff McDuffie's recommendation to me every time we've had a conversation about this is guy needs its own department. We have a much denser population in this area that requires a faster response time than county deputies can offer. There are times where there's only six deputies active in the city, in the county at one time. If they're all on a call somewhere else, Guyton needs to have its own department. So turning it over to the sheriff's office is not a viable option. And that's from a professional. This is not me. Most of the things you will hear me say is not from my opinion, it's from the experts who I go to. If it's police, I go to Chief Berletic and Sheriff McDuffie. If it's law, I go to the city attorney. If it's accounting, I ask our city accountant, Councilman Reeser, because he's an accountant. He's my accountant. But uh, going to the experts and getting information from those folks who really know what they're talking about is important. Ma'am. Good evening, y'all. I just wanted to ask, I've heard a lot of build, 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 but I don't know who's building. And the citizens of Guyton build Guyton to ensure that the money stays in the city. I think you, that's why I said earlier that planning and zoning is so crucial to the process. Because those are the people that are charged with guiding the city and its growth. They're the people that are supposed to be up to date on the zoning ordinances. They're supposed to be up to date with comings and goings like the Hyundai plant and things like that. And I'm frankly tired of hearing, well, we need to prepare for the Hyundai plant. Because the time to prepare for the Hyundai plant was five years ago. We're already five years behind. And that is why it is integral that the whole city works. It's not just city council making all the decisions. Planning and zoning has an integral role to play in that. And those are the people that guide the city and help, you know, set the pathway forward. We shouldn't have to pay an outside agency to tell us how to grow. 
we have the people, just like this room right here, we have enough people in here that you can sit down and come up with a plan. It shouldn't be some outside agency telling us what we need to do. We are uh, hiring the experts. We're doing the engineering that needs to be done that wasn't done in places like Crossgate and Delray um, and um, Hidden Creek. So we are doing things properly now. We're bringing in engineering. We're requiring uh, curbs and sidewalks and those types of things. Uh, we couldn't have planned for Hyundai five years ago because Hyundai wasn't here. They hadn't announced until a year, year and a half ago. So we are doing what we can. We have hired an expert to help us with a master plan because that's not our day job. We have spent good money and you get what you pay for. I'm a Guyton resident and also a union carpenter, so that was the question. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm a, like most of these people here, I've been here about a year, a little over. And first council meeting we went to, Mayor Dean. Ms. Below kind of introduced herself. This is more of a statement. Mayor Dean, you told us we're in kind of a bad spot because of Effingham County doesn't have enough police officers. Pretty good sized county with a lot of people in it. So we're in danger, according to what you said, because we should be staffed 24 7. I mean, that's just from your own words. The other thing that I'm amazed, I've lived all over the state. Cincinnati, Ohio, I've been trucking, I've moved around several times. And what gets me is high density housing. How nobody, you guys talk about this as a historical city, you want to keep the small town of or whatever you want to say it is. But nobody, this new project you're talking about, I don't even know where it is or what it is. But you're going to put houses on a third of an acre. Are we, are we expanding the roads for that? No. I can already answer that. Effingham County is drastically blowing it up and not caring about the citizens. And you're telling me that none of, none of you on the, on the stage here are going to address that? How about put it on one acre lots and cut it down? Then in a uh, sewage problem, put a drip system in. You don't have to put them on the sewage system. And I went to several meetings where you're talking about, and here's another huge thing that I've realized in this county. I moved here. I'm on a third of an acre. In Lawrence County, where Becky and I moved from, I had over an acre. I had a pool. My county taxes, school and everything, $850. I couldn't tell you what I paid or got there. This year, my taxes here, it's going to be $3,300. My God, what are y'all spending it on? Somebody needs to get some physical responsibility. I don't care who it is. That's too much. Yeah. And y'all y'all keep flooding these places with multi high density things and nobody's looking out. You're right. Y'all couldn't look out for five high uh Hyundai coming because they just announced it. But nobody's planning for the future growth of anything. You're you're walking blind. You're telling us all that hey, this is what you're gonna do. I don't use anything in the city of God. Mondays, my wife and I, we're lazy. We're two married kids out of the house. We want a place to eat. You can't eat in God on certain days because nobody's open. You got nothing to appeal to people. Y'all can tell us all you want to, but I'm a stranger here. There's nothing that appeals to me. That's the blunt, honest truth. And then flooding. I live in Crosskit. I wish somebody could understand. You're in a swamp zone. We're spending money where they don't need to be. Buy back houses like other states and cities have done and get them out of the flood zone. Quit allowing contractors to pad somebody's pocket and put a bunch of stuff where it does not belong. And Mayor, I fought overseas. And for you to tell me that I can talk a little bit before a meeting or a little bit after, you are a representation of everything. You have got to listen to us. Now there's ramblings going on, but the one thing, and my wife, I'm sorry, Becky, I'm gonna get it. It seems like there's a huge hostility on that stage for people. How are we supposed to vote for anybody when you guys can't seem to get along at all? How are you gonna represent us with a lot of this? 
Let's close our gap. Thank you. That was a lot and important. Sir, I agree with you on the police. We should be working towards 24-7 coverage. But as we have been lambasted repeatedly with, with increasing the police budget, we've been doing it in incrementally. We're trying to do it in a way that respects people's money and to make it work in a way that works best for the citizens. Guyton, in the last four years, increased required lot sizes for R1 through 4 to half acre. So you cannot build a third work. I mean, we have gone in that direction. The state of Georgia is currently working against that in saying that lots should not be allowed to be less than a quarter. I mean, uh, they, you should not be able to put these restrictions because they want more and more housing to make up for it. So we are currently, through GMA, fighting against the state and trying to find ways to keep what we want to see happen in our community. Local community rights, local control is important. As for taxes, the city does not control the tax digest. We've lowered the millage rate four years in a row, and I know that's not the total answer to the problem because the digest keeps going up. According to Tax Commissioner Linda McDaniels, if the tax digest is not set correctly in the event of a natural disaster or a fire or any number of things, you will not get your replacement cost for your house. There's a reason they set the tax digest where it is. If your house is destroyed in a hurricane or a tornado, you have to be able to replace it, and if it's not set right. Now, as far as the taxes, look at your tax bill. Look at where the money goes. Schools, the county, and the hospital get the lion's share. The city government gets a very minute part, and of that we've lowered our, our section as much as we can every year. During an inflationary time, when everything costs more, we're still able to pull back. Future growth, we've got economic development and recreation master plans. We're working towards uh, infrastructure plans and things. All of these things take years. I agree. If we could have had some more notice about the mega site being one of the biggest economic ventures in the history of the state of Georgia, it would have been very helpful. In fact, now mega sites have to consider the local housing before they announce a mega site in that region. Laws have changed because of what we're dealing with here in the four county region. You're right, Crossgate shouldn't have been built there. Planning and zoning denied that, and then council approved it a long time back. Um, there are GEMA plans, uh, GEMA programs, as the Georgia Emergency Management Agency, or if it is in a floodplain, that homes can be bought back. Most of that isn't in the floodplain required, but there are a few houses that do qualify. If you're interested, I'd be happy to talk more about it. Um, as far as the hostility on this stage, yes, there is opposition, and there have been lies, and there have been things said about people that can't be taken back. There have been things said tonight that are not true. And the reality is, is Three years ago, it drove me off of Facebook to where I would not communicate on there. And the hostility is here because if someone's willing to stand up in a church in front of these people and tell falsehoods, then I have a difficult way of trying to make peace with them. So, thank you all. So, you bring up the budget, and I think that's a or overspending. I think that's a great point that you mentioned. You know, over the past three years, we've continued to overspend and overspend and overspend. You know, I have a solution to that. Uh, you know, if any of us win, you know, the the, uh, the opposition, I would highly recommend that passing a uh, balance of budget amendment that's implemented in the city charter. That way, this uh, camp or this city can no longer overspend. If it's implemented in the city charter, a balance of budget amendment, you have to abide by that balanced budget and you are mandated by that balanced budget amendment to that you were set to spend such and such a dollars and you cannot go over, but you can go under. So that way you are allowed a surplus and that surplus should go back to each and every one of you. So I think that's how you fix the deficit or the debt you know, a balance of budget amendment and guidance would go a long ways to fix this debt that we are having right now. So overspending would be solved with a balanced budget amendment in the city charter. Well, thank, I 
I think that comment demonstrates why he's not qualified to be on council, okay? The city already has a requirement that's called a zero-based budget. So when we put a budget together, it is a year ahead of what actually happens. We don't know what's going to happen next year. If you do, you should be up here running for council. So uh, the idea is that we do our best. We put a budget together based on what we know. We have conversations with the county. We have conversations with... Um, state representatives to understand what revenues are coming. So zero-based budget is this. What are your revenues going to be? The government requires you to spend that money. It is not like I do it and probably not like you do it. I do want to have a surplus. That is not how the government budget works. Whatever your revenues are, you have to allocate that, whether you call that a contingency or whether you call that some big thing you want to do, that is how the zero-based budget. If you look at our audit reports, that are all clean and everything is good, there is no misappropriation like some people will claim, you will see in the back of the budget, in the back of the audit, the original budget and the adjusted budget and the actual numbers. We're not over. We tend to be favorable according, uh, adjusted, or compared to the budget. So, you know, comments like that sound like it makes sense. It doesn't. It's not right. We have a different way. The government requires us to run things differently than you probably do at home. So just remember that. We're not spending money frivolously. We have big conversations about where's the best place to spend money, spend taxpayer dollars. And the mayor was right. 10% or less of your property tax bill, $3,000, probably about 300 of that goes to the city. The rest of it goes to the school, to the IDA, and to the hospital. That's, that's the issue. That's why our property taxes, I lived in Atlanta before I came here, I paid more when I moved here. So I totally understand what you're saying. I got two things on here real quick. Number one, the city charter in section 6.26, .6, Council of Actions on the Budget, requires that once you reach a spending limit, you're not allowed to spend any more money. Like once you spend X amount of dollars that you budgeted at the start of the year, you're not allowed to spend any more money. He wants to talk about the audit. Well, the fiscal year in 2022, on page 38 of the audit, it's on their website. You can go download it. It shows that they were $171,000 plus over budget. That's not my words. That's their auditor's words. And as far as the mayor and his little throwing and calling people liars, if you follow me on Facebook, I include supporting documentation, and I don't say something unless I can prove it. So if you want to fact check me, please feel free to, because I make sure that I research and gather all the facts possible before I say something, because I know what kind of damage it can do if you just make it up as you go. So if the mayor wants to, wants to throw out terms of calling people liars, then please feel free to do it. Please tell me where I lied. So, Marshall, as a deacon of a church, I demand an apology for calling me a liar. Okay. Thank you, candidates. At this time, we are going to conclude everything. I just want to thank every single candidate for participating. Again, special thank you to Kaylee Fedko. And thank you to the audience for coming in. Thank you.